On, it's on, it says. Okay, good morning. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Just keep that, go ahead, turn it back up a little bit so it can be heard. And the name of Jesus, that modern song that's out, speak the name of Jesus. How many of you have been calling on the Lord Jesus? How many of you know there's power in his name? There's life in his name. There's victory in his name. He's the name above every name, right? That's who we serve. That's who we've been called to and blessed to be a part with. Thank God. As the scripture says, thanks be to God who has given us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, hey, this morning we're going to talk about covenants and the covenant that you and I are in and some of the covenants in the Bible. So, I hope you've already said good morning to one another and so on. Uh, go ahead and have a seat and we'll get started. Today, uh, we titled How, or excuse me, Are You in Covenant with God? Are You in Covenant? Are You in Covenant? Amen. How many of you know what a covenant is? How many of you know there's a difference between a contract and a covenant? Do you know what the difference is? I'll read this to you and maybe it'll give you a little understanding. Uh, many times when we talk about water baptism, we talk about the signing of a contract, but in actuality, a contract has no personal, relational elements to it. I can buy a building from somebody and never even meet them, so there's no, no relationship there's no identification. I don't care who the owner was. I don't care what he did. I'm buying a building because I want a building, and so I sign a contract. But you and I have been brought into the covenant. We call it the new covenant in Scripture. And there were many covenants prior to it that we talk about. A covenant is relational. A covenant has some personal element involved, although there are still some areas of I will do this and you will do this and we will work together down through this whole thing till uh, our covenant is complete or till it's fulfilled or till one of us decides we don't want to be in the covenant anymore. And Old Testament, of course, there were many covenants that we can go prior to what we even read about in Scripture. Uh, some of the ancient civilization to where uh, there were covenants between leaders and kingdoms and so on. So these things have gone on forever and they are a part of life. Now, what is a recent covenant that some people make? We call it marriage. You see, when a man and a woman come together in marriage, it's not a contract, it's a covenant. Amen. It's relational. It has some personal element to it. And that's why so many times when we hear um, wedding vows, we want to say, you've got to make them biblical. You've got to make them scriptural. You've got to base them on something that has sustenance and power and element to it because you can take a vow that says we'll scuba dive together for as long as we desire and the depths of the ocean and the sea and the beauty of the you know nature and the fish and everything but that doesn't have any godly element to the point of I'm committing to him or to her and some people don't like this but to watch over her, to keep her, uh, to love her as Christ loved the church, and she will honor him, as the scripture says in Ephesians, uh, you know, provide, you know, stability and be sort of there as a backing for the husband and everything included. That's a covenant. And you and I are in a covenant with Amen. the Lord as God made covenants throughout history with some of the men. We have uh, the covenant with Adam. Remember when Adam broke the covenant, what happened? He had to leave 
the garden. Amen. If you're in a contract with someone for a rental property or a lease and you break the contract or a mortgage on a home, because you're in a contract, they can put you out. And so in covenant relationship, it's very similar, except there's a personal relationship. How do we know that? Because God knew Adam, and Adam knew God. And God walked in the garden with Adam, and God spoke to Adam and showed him what he wanted him to do and told him things to abstain from and things to keep. Isn't that true? Yes. And so there was a relationship. There was a personal association in that. That's a covenant. Then you have the Noahide covenant. What was it with Noah? Noah was charged to build the boat. And Noah was charged to go into the boat and take the animals and all those that would obey and come with him. And so God made a covenant with Noah because you have been a righteous preacher, uh, a preacher of righteousness. You and your family have found favor and grace in my eyes. So here's what I want you to do so that I can enact my covenant with you and save you from these things that are to come. Then you had the Abrahamic covenant, which we'll talk a little bit more about, where Abraham, now Noah was to go in, right, to the ark. Amen. Abraham was to go out of the land, out from serving idols and the gods of your family. Anybody, your family got other gods? Are you really aware of that, that they don't serve the same God you serve? You pay attention to that. So, you know, sometimes you got to, you know, you got to draw some lines in some of those things and say, hey, that's as far as we go with this. So the uh, Abrahamic covenant, we'll talk a little bit about more. Uh, then there's the Mosaic covenant, right, with Moses. He sent Moses in to bring the people out. And he said, I am with you. When he said to go to Pharaoh, he said, tell him I am sent me, which means I'm with my people. And then there was the Davidic covenant that God promised David he would raise up someone to sit on his throne forever and lead and rule the nations and uh, the kingdom. And so in all this, we see uh, those are the main Covenants we talk about. How many of you know that God actually made a covenant with Hagar? Remember when Hagar gave birth to Ishmael? And finally, uh, Abraham knew he had to put Hagar out and Ishmael out because of the division in the house, ones of the flesh and ones of the promise of the sons. And so he put Hagar out. And Hagar was out there in the wilderness by the bush the dry, the heat, everything else. Ishmael, the baby, is crying, and she fears that he's going to die there. But God made a covenant with Hagar that I've seen him, I've seen you, and I'll make of him a great nation. That's a covenant. And so we have a covenant in the New Testament, the greatest covenant that we can talk about because it affects us, but it's a covenant of personal relationship that there's no longer a veil between us and our God. As I've said, the numerous people at the Western Wall there in Jerusalem, listen, there's no wall between me and my God. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, whom I serve, through Jesus Christ, there's no wall between me and him. I can go in freely into the holy place because of the blood of the Lamb, right? And so can you. It's our, it's our promise it's what God has covenanted with us. But you know, covenants aren't one-sided. And I think that's what we're hearing a lot of today. God's made this promise, and so we get to partake of it, and we'll, wait a minute, what's your responsibility in the covenant? Why do you read the scripture? Why do you read the New Testament and the Old Testament Many times the Old Testament will explain to us what the New Testament means about what it says Amen. in so many things. And we'll read through some of these things this morning, but we're keeping covenant with the Lord. And so 
We talk about taking the emblems, the body and the blood of Jesus, representing at the Passover dinner when Jesus would talk about the new covenant. We're talking about the greatest covenant there is with us, that all men can now come and serve the Lord. Nobody is hindered except they've got to come by the right way. But he's made a covenant with us. And there are things we have to keep and do regardless of what people say. As so many times I've said, this terminology that I am free to be free means I have no requirement, I have nothing I have to do, I'm not obligated to anything, then you must not be in a covenant relationship. Because God tells us all the way through the scriptures the many things that we are to do to maintain the covenant. If you bought a house and you have a mortgage on that house and you signed a contract, that contract tells you that you must provide insurance enough to cover the mortgage on that house. And if there's damages to that house, all of the repairs, you must cover enough insurance or have enough insurance to cover any total rebuild that ever comes about, or you have broken the relationship with the bank. When you rent a car, you either buy their car insurance or you are obligated to notify your insurance company, it's all documented, that you will insure that car to its maximum value if it's damaged or totaled or whatever the case may be. There's requirements on every side. Are you with me? Amen. So what are you doing? What am I doing? What are we as the church doing keeping our covenant? It's a love relationship. It's a personal relationship. There's a lot of uh, elements involved here. Family, inheritance, everything else. But what are we doing to keep that relationship? To keep that covenant? To make sure we're fulfilling what he said is our obligation. People don't like those terms for some reason. But yeah, we're obligated to do things to keep covenant with the Lord. And what are we doing in that? How much of that are we mindful of all the time? How many times in your marriage, and I don't want anybody to raise your hand, <laughs> you had to go back and you took notes at the wedding while you were up there taking your vows and you said, oh my gosh, I forgot I said I would love him for better and for worse and for richer and poorer, what? Who put those words in there? I just wanted to scuba dive and see the beauty of the deep blue sea. I'm obligated to do this? Or he says, provide for her. Do you know how much she demands? How much she requires? She thinks she's a princess, a queen. And then there's this thing out here, everybody becomes a queen when they get married, and so they are now allowed to have everything they can possibly imagine. It doesn't matter if he works nine to five and makes 45,000 a year. I want a 9,000 square foot house with a 2,000 square foot swimming pool because I want to sunbathe and I want my body to be beautiful and you're obligated to give me everything I need or want because you said so in the vow. Whew. I'm tired just saying that. And thank the Lord for wives who've never gone there. But listen, in seriousness, have you ever had to go back and think, wait a minute. No, I got to stick with this through better and worse. Amen. Through sickness. Because we enjoyed the health times. Amen. Now it's getting a little bit tough now. It's getting a little bit costly, various things. We all know folks that have taken off in those times. But listen, I made a commitment. That love commitment, that love relationship, there was a relational thing. There was something personal between me and her or, or him and her or her and him and so on. And 
you know, now he's not able to provide like he did before because there's some sickness or there's some medical issue and I need to stick with him. Yeah, I guess if I didn't think about that all of a sudden, and for us who are believers, listen, the Holy Spirit brings things to remembrance like that. And then you think how many times he or she stuck with me through some things that were ordeals or hard or trials or maybe embarrassing at a time or various things. I remember a husband who lost his job and started drinking as a believer, but he was so depressed that he couldn't provide for his wife and his kids that he just started drinking and it took him over. Hopefully by this time in life, he's come through that and out of it. Yes, there's mercy and grace in all that. Remember, God knows why we fall into things. And if we're not loving this stuff and diving into it more and more, he's there to bring us through. It's why we pray and believe. Remember, Abraham had this covenant agreement, but then he patiently waited and endured till he saw it come to pass. And did he really see it all come to pass? No, he hasn't seen all of us. We're all part of all of that commitment that your seed will be uh, greater than the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. Amen. And we're still watching it come to pass. He's long gone, gone home to wherever he is, right? So are you in covenant with God this morning? And you know, if you lapse on that insurance policy, all of a sudden you get a cancellation notice. You may say, well, I only let it go for a little while. I only quit providing for my wife for uh, six months or so. Uh, you know, uh, whatever the, she hasn't eaten for six months. Uh, it's only been a while. Well, how long does it have to go before you realize I need to get back in that covenant? How do we get there? We ask God to forgive us for a breaking covenant. Yeah. You can read back there in the scriptures in Jeremiah when they broke covenant with God. He says, you began to oppress the people and do things I told you not to do. And so now I'm withdrawing some of my benefits from you. And we wonder why that happens. It's never his fault. It's always our fault because we leave the commitments that we made. As I've said, and I know some of you don't like to hear it, listen, throughout the years there's been many people who said, I will do this, I will do that, I'll be there for you, and so on. And I look for them, and where are you? What happened? All the commitments. That's why the Bible tells you be very careful before you make a vow. Amen. A vow maybe that you will never pay or can't keep. You're to be very cautious before you say that. Your yea be yea and your nay be nay because anything else is sin. Amen. Because it means you're trying to wiggle waggle around or you're trying to deceive or maybe you're not even aware of it, but you're not going to fulfill it. And he says you got to be careful of those things and don't make a vow to God that you cannot pay, he said. So... The true meaning of a covenant is a relationship between two partners who make binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. Now, what's the common goal in your marriage? Some people thought it was children. No, it's not children. Children are a product of you keeping the covenant Amen. that God put you in. Amen. The the goal is the two become one and continue as one until the end as we say unto death do us part Amen. that's the goal to show the world out here that what god joins together and no man is to put asunder he will keep to the end and as i've said in the past and will continue to say listen if that didn't work ask god to forgive you don't just go on as though it's nothing if there's divorce and things, God didn't say that's the unpardonable sin, but he did say he doesn't, he hates divorce, as we read it in the scripture. Uh, it says, so they're often accompanied by oaths. We make an oath to do this, a sign, 
or a ceremony. What happens when you have the covenant of marriage come together? You have a ceremony. When we say we're coronating somebody, they went home to be with the Lord because the covenant is fulfilled. fulfilled. There's a ceremony. We celebrate them going home to be with the Lord. Covenants define obligations and commitments. They define them. Read the scripture. Jesus said, you search the scripture because in them you think eternal life. You have eternal life or salvation. But he said, you won't come to me. And so there's areas here we've always got to pay attention to. Covenants define, define our obligations. Well, wait a minute. We don't even need to look at this if we're not obligated to anything. Right? Why do we have so many pages? Why do we have 66 books? Why do we have so many authors who wrote things out for us if there were no obligations? One-sided covenant. I'll do all this for you. You just enjoy life. What happens to a, when they talk about trust fund babies? Trust fund babies grow up, and because there's a trust fund, they say lots of them never worked a day in their life. Some people say they become politicians, but they say they've never worked a day in their life. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to deal with real people because they've had it so good. Now, a lot of good men have never allowed that to happen. And I don't mean to say everybody is like that, uh, because they're not. But if you allow that, that anything they get into, you bail them out. Uh, anytime they have need money, they got cash to go to. They've never had to worry about, you know, maybe I need the budget. Maybe I need to cut back. I would say to everybody today, listening to what's out there in the world, you better start budgeting everything you have. Amen. Pay attention to sources of things and realize you might not be able to be as extravagant as you were and you might say i don't think i'm extravagant at all well listen we'll all take a travel over to india we'll go visit our friends uh pastor noel finney john or uh, pastor sukumar pastor jessidus we'll go over there and then you see how extravagant you've been living amen compared to what they live yet they're faithful to the covenant. So it's uh, obligations and commitments, but they are not like a contract, again, because they are relational and personal. Really, the family all becomes like a covenant-type unit because you have husband and wife, you have sons and daughters. The sons and daughters have obligations and things you put on them to fulfill to keep you as their parents so they can stay in the house so that you don't have to do what God had to do with Adam and put him out, right? Amen. And again, marriage is one of those covenants. Uh, many times we do have to go back and remember what we vowed to do and what my part is in all of this and how that all relates to us, of course, is because the gospel says that we're looking into a wedding vow that Christ is the groom and we're the bride of Christ, right? So we're taking a vow to the one that we love. We're making a covenant relationship with Christ that we have to fulfill to maintain or to have this salvation in the end. Uh, it's amazing because so many different denominations of various groups I say to some of these fellows from the back Baptist background, you talk to one of the Baptist fellows and he says, oh, you don't have to do anything but believe. You talk to the other Baptist fellow, he says, if you break these laws and these commandments, we have to put you out of the church. So you go different realms and you see a lot of different things, but the thing is getting back to what the scripture says and doing what it says and making it very clear. As we read about in Habakkuk, write the vision the vision and make it clear so it's very intelligible and very readable for anyone who comes to it to fulfill it. So you had the Adam, uh, Adam Adamic, uh, Adamic uh, 
covenant, Noahide covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the Davidic covenant. And we talked about even Hagar being a covenant that God made and said, I will make of him a great nation. So let's go to Genesis uh, chapter 15 this morning. And we'll start around verse 5, but I'll just give you the little bit of prelude there. And I'm glad you're here. I would love to see some other folks that need to be back in church around. And some of you, listen, I don't know what to do to say, how can we shake you up a little bit? What about, you know, being here? In the start of things, and I've said this before, and I'm going to keep just trying to edify you to say, hey, listen, come on. You need to hear what's going on. You're only here usually one day a week. And so to pay attention and to get it all for your good, for your benefit, because things are shaken up out here very quickly. You know, they're talking now more and more. They just said that the, this nuclear threat is greater than it ever was back with Kennedy. Back in the days when you and I in the school were told we could hide under the desk and we'd be okay. Very much worse now than it ever was. More nuclear arms out here. More people that are like, I don't know, hair trigger mentally that will, would love to do some of these things. And I don't say that to say we need to live in a, a fear zone or some kind of thing like that. But we need to be attentive. How many of you heard that uh, in 25 days, our nation may run out of diesel fuel? And who runs on diesel fuel? All the, All the trucking, diesel generators everywhere, producing power in places and everything else. Hospitals that have backup generators, uh, some of those will be diesel, some will be natural gas. But uh, just think about all the diesel things. Ships run on diesels. and. All kinds of stuff you can think of. A lot of automotive uh, vehicles and regular pickup trucks and trucks run on diesel. All farm equipment, most of it runs on diesel. All trains. So you think about all these kind of things that are happening right now along with everything else you're hearing. When will we pay attention? When will we shake ourselves and say, you know what? I'm living this kind of life. I better get my, my nose to the grindstone a little bit about the gospel, about the things of God. Do you remember when you were younger and you thought about eternal things and not just about getting through life? We need to get back there again. Want revival in people, want to see people get saved, but if they're watching a lot of us to where we're not really committed to anything other than I go to church on Sunday and go home, why would they want to follow us unless they're looking for a, I go to church on Sunday and that's all I have to do? Lifestyle. Relational means I know Jesus. Amen. Oh, I'm going to be married to him, but you know what? We've been espoused to him already when we took this relation, this commitment and said, I'm going to serve you. We're already espoused. We're just waiting for the wedding day. That means I'm supposed to have thought about him, about when I'm going to be with him and what we're going to do and how we're going to live together and everything else as a woman would look for her bride or her husband uh, to come and get her in the Jewish wedding. All these things, we're in these days and times. Is it scary? Sometimes it is. I was up half the night last night thinking about what's going to happen with so-and-so if this happens. How's that going to go? Who's going to be able to be able to sustain lifestyle if these things really change? Why, wait a minute, but God, this is America. It's not supposed to happen here. But the plan is to make it happen here that's been fulfilled, being fulfilled here in the last few years. Have you noticed people's prayers aren't working on stopping a lot of that stuff? Because it's God that's allowing it to come to pass. Because of the day and the hour that we're in. Because of the sins of the lands. The nations. When our nation was promulgating homosexuality around the world. Promulgating abortion around the world. What does that make us? We're the initiator of it all. Throughout the globe. We deserve more judgment than anybody else. 
And some of the people that are loving the abortions can't see that their name in the name of Jesus and Jesus has nothing to do with it. He's Amen. totally against it. Amen. And he's judging nations because of it. Yeah. Not just abortion, broken marriages, broken families, men leaving their wives and their children and everything else. It all brings judgment on the land. I told you somebody, or maybe you weren't here, it was a Wednesday night, I said I was talking to somebody who said about the economy, the economy, the economy. And I finally said, listen, the economy is based on our morality. If we're not moral and right in the eyes of God, you should expect a downturn in the economy. You should expect poverty and immigrants and foreigners to overrun your streets because that's what God said would happen. When your morality turns from God and becomes all about what I can get and who I can put it to and how I can overpower and who I can oppress, you're not going to have the favor of God and whatever money you do get, it's not going to buy what it bought. Are we seeing any of that? Yet why aren't these precious metals and things, they should be almost five times what they are right now. Because the dollar has been so debased, although they keep trying to prop it up. We need to pay attention to these things. We're in a covenant with God. Uh, Genesis 15. God met with Abram. Abram said in verse 2, What will you give me, seeing I have no seed, I'm childless, and so on. He said about uh, Eleazar of Damascus and God said, well, that's not going to be the promise. And so we go down through here. He says, I have no seed. There's nobody in my house. Uh, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this shall not be thine heir. That young man's not going to be your heir. He's going to come forth of your own vows. In verse 5, it says, and he brought him forth abroad and said, God said to Abram, look now toward heaven. Hey, everybody, where's our help come from? From heaven, right? He said, look up from whence cometh your help. Look up from where your redemption comes from. You're not going to find answers here in the earth. But he says, look up toward heaven. Tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, counted it to him for righteousness. And he said, the Lord said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. He's the Lord that brought you out of this land that we all dwell in to make you one of his. He brought you out of this world and into the kingdom of God. A covenant relationship for every one of us. I'm the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Abram, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Listen, or is anybody saying, Lord, how can I really know I'm going to make it into the kingdom? How can I really know that you're going to see me through all this? Abram asked. Remember, God already saw him as righteous. But he asked, how shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he, the Lord, said to him, take me a heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon dove what's he saying offer to me this is the cutting of the covenant here you remember all this this is the agreement god is making with abram but it required something on abram's behalf god was putting up everything he wanted abram to put up something you and i listen god has put up everything for us Everything we have need of. He says in the scripture, how can we boast when everything we have has been given to us? 
There's nothing you and I have done in this deal, this covenant that we're a part of, that is worth anything, that God needed any of it. He gave it all. But he gave us requirements. As he said to Abram, take the three of these and the three of these and the three of these and the turtle dove and the pigeon dove. And it says in verse 10, he took unto him all these things, which meant, I believe you. I want the covenant. I want to be one with you. I want you to be my protector. As it was among the kings of the lands. When they made agreement, they protected each other. I want your benefit. But what do we give back? The kings protected each other. So we stand in defense of the gospel. We defend the word of God as what he said, as Paul said. Many things were not ashamed of the gospel because we're in covenant with the gospel and the God of the gospel. He took him all these and divided them in the midst. What did he do dividing them? He split them in half and laid each piece one against another, but the, the, the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham, Abram drove them away. Now, the offering was divided. We read in the New Testament, we talked about this, where the veil was rent in twain or in two, right? These animals were split in two. When I was in the food business and we used to get our chickens whole and had to cut them up uh, to, to do the chicken pieces and the dinners and so on, the first thing you did was you split the chicken in two right down the center. And then everything else from there was easy, you could say pickings, easy cutting. But the animals were cut in two. The veil was torn in two. We read last week in Hebrews that we enter in by a new and living way. I think it's Hebrews 10.20. We enter in by, and it might even be on here, Hebrews 10.20. We enter in by a new and living way through the veil. Right? What's the veil represent? His flesh. The representation of the, the veil being torn in two, his flesh being torn in two for us as these sacrificial animals in the covenant were laid in two. When the fowls came down upon the car carcasses, Abram drove them away. And so many people have come up with something as to what that means. I don't know, does it just mean you're not going to mess with my covenant with this God, with the Lord? I'm going to see it fulfilled. Nothing's going to get in the way. Would you protect what you're doing that way? Those fowls could have probably attacked him. Who knows what they were? Like an eagle, like a vulture, uh, whatever, the buzzards, whatever the case may be. Abram drove them away, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. Remember the deep sleep that fell on Adam? And what came from that? Life. Eve. A deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. This is the captivity. He's telling Abram even then that this is what's going to come to pass because of where the people will go in their hearts. They shall be afflicted, or they shall afflict them for 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. But I'm going to go against that nation for what they did to your lineage, my people. And they shall come out with great substance. Remember when the Egyptians laden them down with all kinds of goods, prosperity and wealth. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. In other words, Abraham, you're going to pass this life in peace and be buried in a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they're going to come forth. And then it talks about the lamp 
The smoking, it was dark, a furnace, a burning lamp passed between the pieces of the sacrifice. And in the same day, in verse 18, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. The furnace, the lamp, representing the Lord walking in the midst of the sacrifice. Under thy seed have I given this land from the river Egypt of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, and so on. Abraham's covenant. Uh, Hebrews 6, 12. Hebrews 6, 12, it says, because God could swear by no greater. He swear by himself. I think we talked about uh, this just a little bit, talking about promises. Start in verse 11, it says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Are you still loving your husband or your wife? You still loving the job that you signed uh, with the union and so on? The union is a contract, you know, because we're in Ohio. If you don't have a contract with a company, they can let you go at any time. That's what your union deal is, and that's what a lot of people, when they take a job that's not a um, salary job, or wait a minute, uh, is it salary? No. When you take the uh, hour, hourly job, if you take a salary job, you need a contract. Uh, so hourly jobs are with unions a lot of times, but if not, you have no, if they tell you today, you've worked 10 days, we don't need you anymore, you have to go. And they don't owe you a thing from that point on. I learned that uh, the hard way as a young man when a company hired me and I came to work that day and they decided they changed their mind. They weren't going to go through with the deal. They just realized they didn't want to spend that money and so on. And so I got a check for $100 and a thank you for what I thought was going to be a start of a career uh, and a good, good pay and good benefit back in the day. But it's the law. And they embarrassed my attorney uh, in the fact that he didn't think that was the law when it was the law. So that's how things work. So, we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That you be not slothful or sluggish, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Listen, there's still a lot of promises we're expecting to see come to pass. We haven't seen them as yet. Abraham went to his grave in peace, but he hadn't seen it all come to pass. And we may not either. Be not slothful or sluggish, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Listen. And our covenant is involved in all this. God who created, God who redeemed, God who sustains is the very God who's made covenant with every one of us. Could swear by no greater. You could take the president of the United States, whichever one you liked, and have him make a covenant with you. And that covenant, gosh, this is like almost prophetic, could just go by the wayside. It's actually truth and life. So many of them had made agreements when they're running for office and said, I'm for this, I'm for that. And they always do it this way. Have you noticed? Or they do this thing. They don't want to point at you because, gosh, you might remember that. No, it's politically incorrect. But they said this and they said that and you never saw it come to pass because there's no greatness in them. They can't make it happen. But God who spoke the heavens and the earth and all these things can make it all happen. Yes. And he said he will make it all happen. And he said there's nothing that I have promised that I will not or cannot do. There's nobody like a Congress to get in his way and say, God, we're not going to let you do that. 
He's going to do it regardless. There's no principalities. There's no powers. They're not going to assassinate him. Although they're going to war with Jesus when he comes. They won't be able to stop what he said because he could swear by no greater. He swear by himself. Saying, surely, blessing, I will bless thee. And this is back in Genesis 2. And multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Are you patiently enduring? Are you keeping the faith? I can do this almost every week about anything we talk about. Are you still praying about it and thanking the Lord for it, even though you aren't seeing it yet? Are you trusting him? And then are you saying, wait a minute, Lord, am I asking to heap this on my own lust? Like we read about in James, you have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask amiss so that you may heap it upon your own pleasures, desires, wants. Somebody's going to look at me as the great one. Is that why it's not happening? Think about it. What are you after in the Lord? Are you after perfection in Christ, maturity in Christ, holiness in Christ? God, I keep doing this. I need help. I, need, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to act like that anymore. I don't want to like this stuff anymore. After he patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. An oath of confirmation. He said, I can't swear by anybody greater, so I'm going to swear by myself. Blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. It says here that that becomes the end of it. What's that mean? means the promise is settled for you and I. If we will get in this place, he swore an oath to us. All through the scripture, what we read when he says, if you will do this, I will do that. We could go back to Deuteronomy, but there's so many things in the New Testament. He said, if you'll keep my ways, if you'll follow me, if you'll walk with me, if you'll abstain from these things. It becomes an end of strife. Why, why do I have to strive for things? Maybe I see other men with them. I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. But I don't have to strive. It's confirmed. You know, I saw something uh, somebody put out or some statement they were making about something. And I thought, you know what? When a man knows who he is, he doesn't have to pretend to be anybody. Now listen. Listen. In that, it doesn't mean you be an obstinate, self-centered, snap back, attack back, all that kind of stuff, because I know who I am. No, it's not like that. It means when you know who you are in Christ, you don't have to put up a hand. You don't have to come back with anything. You can just walk as though, you know what, they just don't understand you know that's how Moses had to be because he thought they would understand that God had sent him to deliver him, but he found out because of their hard-heartedness and their stiff-neckedness, they wouldn't surrender or submit to that when they accused him, are you going to kill me too? He thought they would understand, but they didn't. And Many times we look at people and think they'll understand, and they don't. And they may be walking with you all the time, sitting with you at every meal. A lot of parents think we we thought our sons and daughters would understand one day, and we saw, gosh, they must not have got it. They must not understand how important this is, how real this is. And listen, the thing is, talking with some pastors again, hey, if they come and take the church buildings and everything else, what's going to happen with the people? How many of them have a heart that, listen, we're going to do this anyway. Do it in the field, do it in the house, do it in the back of a pickup truck, whatever the case. 
We're going to serve the Lord regardless. We're going to do worship and praise wherever we are. You see, you can't not force a conversion to the Lord or away from the Lord. You can't take Jesus out of somebody's heart where the Bible says he dwells by faith. No matter what you take from them, take their life from them. That's okay. They're going to be with the Lord, Amen. the one you tried to separate them from. They're going to be gathered together with them more than they ever have. Isn't that the truth? Yes. So it says, for men verily swear by greater, by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of it all. If the president says this is what we're going to do, then that should be the end of it all. We should watch for it to come to pass. But so many times it's never come to pass, right? No matter who you're talking about, this one, the last one, the ones before, it doesn't matter. It's not a political party issue. Where in God? Where, where in God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of his promise, anybody heirs of the promise? Do you know if you're of uh, faith in Christ Jesus, you become the seed of Abraham. So now you have the promise also. Romans, it talks about the promise being to them of the law, excuse me, and to them that are in the faith. And so we're in the promise. Uh, to show the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. He confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. Does it look like the covenant's not coming to pass in your life, but you're in the covenant you can have strong consolation, he says. Be at peace. It has to come to pass. You may go through struggles. You may go through hardships. We know Abram walked a long ways. He dwelt in tents, no sure place to stay. But the covenant came to pass. It's working in us now. Two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation. Who have fled for refuge. Anybody run from the world to get into the kingdom? You may not have understood it. He's saying you're running for refuge. You're looking for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Listen, it's still there. It's always going to be there. No matter what you go through in life. If you still keep walking toward the hope and walking toward that in the consolation that he gives us, it says that we fled for refuge. We came running out of where we were to lay hold upon the hope set before us. What did Jesus endure the affliction for? For the hope, the glory set before him. 19 says, which hope we have. As an anchor of the soul. Hey, you get a little, can I use the term, freaked out about some stuff? You get stressed. You get that feeling, you know, feels like my head's going to pop off my shoulders. I don't know how much more I can take. He's the anchor of our soul. We have hope, which is an anchor of our soul, both sure and steadfast and which entereth into that within the veil. What's within the veil? The holiness of God. The Lord God himself. Amen. The presence of God. We know the veil is torn in two, but it's talking about back in those days. Beyond the veil was the Lord. Amen. The holiness of God. So he could swear by no greater, so he swore by himself. Romans chapter 4, verse 13. <clears throat> or I'm sorry, verse 8 through 13. <clears throat> Where we read this couple, maybe two months ago, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's us. If we stay in the blood covenant... Right? This is a blood covenant. Jesus shed his blood for a covenant with us. 
Uh, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh his blessedness then upon the circumcision only, that's the circumcision in the flesh, which Abraham was required by God to keep the covenant to circumcise the flesh of himself and all those of his of the male, uh, male gender. Or upon the uncircumcision also, does this forgiveness of sin come upon us who aren't maybe circumcised in the flesh? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision, God gave Abraham righteousness before he was circumcised because he believed the Lord. And so because he believed the Lord, he obeyed what God said and received circumcision as a sign, the Bible tells us over in Romans. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. You and I believed on the Lord. We had our sins forgiven. Then we found ourselves in covenant with the Lord. And now we walk with him. And now we fulfill the righteousness that he's given us. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. He got the faith and the righteousness before he was circumcised, and he received the seal of righteousness of the faith, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imparted to them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. The father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, which means in the physical they may not be circumcised, but who also walk in the steps of faith. They walk as Abraham walked. Listen, we're all walking today not knowing exactly what we encounter. As Abraham, Abram, walked not knowing where he was going, but following the Lord. For the promise in verse 13, that he should be the heir of the world, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And every one of us are called to walk in that righteousness and be in the faith. Luke chapter 22, and we'll finish here. Luke chapter 22, verse 14. We'll start there. We're going to talk about our covenant. And I, let's see, Luke 20. And I put the marker there in the wrong place, but here we are. Luke chapter 22, verse 14. This is Jesus, preparation for the Passover dinner, the Last Supper, as we say. And he said unto them with desire, I'm sorry, and when the hour was come, in verse 14, he sat down. Chapter 22 of Luke, verse 14, when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. That desire was because the new covenant was going to be initiated. 
He was going to bring them into what he knew God the Father had ordained. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Verse 17 says, And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. So the body being broken again, the veil being torn in two, as it said, uh, I think we talked Hebrews 10, 20, by a new and a living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, the veil of the temple, which we know was torn in two from the bottom to the top, symbolizing that it was or from the top to the bottom, symbolizing that God had torn the veil, not that man had done it. Uh, it says to say his flesh. And in Matthew 27, it talks about the veil of the temple again being torn in two. It's what he's representing here. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. He's initiating this covenant that you and I are walking in. So today, as we partake of the body and the blood of Jesus, as we call communion, the fulfilling of the Passover, the fulfilling of the, uh, the new covenant, I want you to be mindful of what your part and my part in this covenant entails. What did we agree to? What did we allow to be a part of all of this for us, a requirement. What vow did we make? What commitment did we make? How many ways can I say it? Are we becoming sluggish? Are we slack from what we agree to do? Have we allowed where we're to provide for our wife? Have we allowed that to go slack for some time? Have we not been honoring our husband, as we would say, or honoring the Lord, who is the groom in this marriage that you and I are a part of? Have we not been honoring him in the way that we should? Have we not been submitting to him as we should? As the husband, as it says in some of the scripture, there is like the salvation of the wife. Hey, Jesus is our salvation, right? It's in him that we live and move and have our being. It's him that's our protector and our provider in all these things. I pray these words aren't falling on deaf ears. Or are they? Are they falling on a place where, you know, I've done enough. I, I just, I'm not going to fulfill any of this anymore. Or I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to try to think what can I do or should I do or Lord, what do you want me to do anymore? That's all we've heard for years and years. But it's the vow we made. If your wife says to you tomorrow, listen, hon, you haven't been providing this last week or so. What's going on? And some of you, you've been maybe into providing so much, you've let other things go. Remember, that's not the extent of it all. This relationship with the Lord is the reason you're able to provide. Our Amen. vow and our commitment with him, our covenant with him, is why we can fulfill what we need to fulfill in all these things. And so we want to honor him as the bride is to honor the husband, right? And so we do all these things, and the husband is to lay down his life as Christ loved the church. Amen. And he's already laid down his life. Remember back there when Isaac was offered, and maybe I missed a scripture here because I know I had that somewhere, when Isaac was offered, or we, we started with that, I believe, it was because God saw what Abram, Abram would do, 
that he would offer his only son. And he said, because of that, here's what I'm going to do. How many because of that are in our lives? Where God would look and say, because you did this, because you're doing this, because you're keeping this, because you're walking this way, because you're fulfilling what I'm saying. How many of those are in us where God looks and says, because of that, I'm going to move this because of that. I'm going to cause this to come. Because of this, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to meet you. I'm going to cause what looked like failure to become great gain. I'm going to cause what looked like it would never ever come to pass because you've been patiently waiting and patiently saying, thank you, Lord. I believe in you, Lord. I haven't given up. Now I'm going to cause it to come to pass. Because of that, because of this, because you kept it, because you were, because you are in all these things. Amen? Amen. So why don't you stand and let's uh, take your emblems this morning and excuse me, I'll be right back because I forgot to get mine. Hey, so everybody, why don't you just stand and let's just, Lord God, we ask you just to sanctify. We thank you for this covenant. Thank you for the body of Jesus that was broken for us, as it says in the scripture here, and for the cup of his blood. It says it was the New Testament or the New Covenant in his blood. So he said, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So I want you just to really think about this covenant, that God has given us everything. Jesus' body was broken or torn in two, representing that veil at the temple being torn in two, signifying that it's now open for all who will come in and worship through the blood of the Lamb. He said, this do in remembrance of me. Shall we partake of this, the bread? Just being ever mindful Lord, we give you thanks and praise this morning. We thank you for this covenant. Covenant of life. Father, a covenant of peace, a covenant of joy. A covenant of eternal life. Covenant of being present with you forevermore, living and dwelling with you. The marriage being complete. The espousal being completed being one with the Father forevermore, one with Christ. We thank you this morning. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. We love you. We worship you, Lord. Faith, you said, works by love. Believe in you works by love. Trust in you works by love. A marriage relationship works by love. We give you praise. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I thank you for that broken body. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise this morning. We exalt your holy name. Thank you for the bread of life. Thank you for a savior. Thank you for a redeemer. Thank you that he took that wrath of our sin upon himself. God, we're not awaiting the wrath of God. We are marked for reward. We are sealed as Abraham was sealed. We are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Life eternal, the kingdom of heaven, the glory of God, the light of God. 
eternity with the Father. We thank you this morning. We give you praise. No more sorrow, no more tears, no crying, no lamenting, no more need of faith. It's all accomplished. It's all fulfilled. No more tormentor, no more accuser in the presence of our God. You're the creator. You're the, the sustainer, the redeemer. You're the one who's able to keep us from falling. Keep us, O oh Lord. We thank you. We give you praise, give you glory. And then Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Ah, oh, thank you, Jesus. Shall we partake of the cup, the blood of the lamb? The new covenant in my blood. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise this morning. Go ahead, lift up your voices. Go ahead and praise the Lord this morning. Love the Lord. Love the Lord. I'm reminded of my covenant. Reminded of my obligation. Reminded of what I've agreed to, what I signed on for. God, that it's not a contract, it's a love covenant. It's a personal covenant, a personal relation. God, it's a covenant we love to fulfill. We fulfill because we love you, because you loved us. We honor you this morning. Don't want to let down my covenant relationship, my requirements, Lord. I want to be faithful to the end. Praise you, Jesus. For better or for worse, till death, as we say in the marriage vow, that you be glorified. God, that I make it in the kingdom, we make it in the kingdom. Lord, that we not be slack, we not be sluggard. We praise you this morning. Ah, oh, Lord God, revive us. Revive us. Renew in us. Make new in us. God, a hunger to do your will greater love in us toward you to fulfill your word fulfill your ways accomplish what you've called us to lord not to let this life in this world snuff out the purpose of god in our lives we love you jesus i just thank you again for that body broken as our young sister said, though she went through some hardships and physical things in her flesh, Jesus endured so much more for us. Oh, my Lord, my God, that we be ever mindful. Holy Spirit, bring it always to remembrance what the wrath would have been like if it wasn't for the blood. If it wasn't for the Savior, if it wasn't for Jesus, if it wasn't for that God loved us so much he sent his Son. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The joy and strength would rise up in us, Lord. Praise be to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you for the new and the living way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the open veil. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that we can boldly come in. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Lord. I don't want to play church anymore. I don't want to be a slackered or a sluggard in the things of God anymore. I don't want to make excuse anymore. I don't want to let you down, Lord. How we make enough mistakes as it is. Don't want to rebel against you. Don't want to refuse. Don't want to quench the spirit. Grieve the spirit. Don't want to drag the cross of Christ in open shame. Bring reproach on the gospel. And I don't want to be ashamed of you. I don't want to be ashamed of your words. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you for the day you said the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Ah, we're going to keep having the victories till whenever that is, or if it's already, we have the victory. We thank you for it. We give you the praise this morning. Thank you that you love us with an everlasting love. Thank you that we have an advocate with the Father that if we sin, we confess our sin, he's faithful to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Ah, we love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Father. I thank you, Lord God. Ah, thank you, Jesus. We know more than anybody what God has done in us. We know the depravity of where we are or were. We knew the sinfulness, the wickedness, the foulness. We knew the lying heart we had, the deception. We knew the dark thoughts of our minds. Maybe nobody else knew. We know what God has forgiven. We know what's in our alabaster box, don't we? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead. Hey, would you put the songs on? Let's just go ahead and praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We worship you. Thank you, Jesus. That's good. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you. Praise God.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, I know you're out there on the camera here listening in. Just worship with us. Everybody's entering in. I hope you can hear that. have a covenant with God. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead, just praise the Lord. Those of you that are listening in, thanks for being with us. That'll be the end of our ministry for today. I hope you could sing along and worship with us. And we're just going to keep thanking God.